Megan, are we going to have any other classes, or should we wait? All right, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you all for joining us today at our third annual West Senior High Simon Tech internship presentations. I stand before you with immense honor and pride as we celebrate the remarkable achievements of our students. The Simon Tech Career Internship Program has been a transformative journey for our students, exposing them to the intricacies of professional positions that they may choose to pursue with future training and education. Through hands-on experiences and exposure to real-world scenarios at supervised work sites, our students have gained valuable career insights and honed essential pre-skill or pre-career skills. A heartfelt expression of gratitude is due to the businesses that have generously supported our students, providing them with a unique and invaluable opportunity to grow and excel. I extend my deepest appreciation to our parents and our dedicated teaching staff who whose unwavering support has been instrumental in making this experience a resounding success. Without further ado, let us let us uh, commence today's presentation by welcoming Hayden, who will share his insightful internship journey at Nealis Engineering. at Nialis Engineering. Um, Nialis is a company that when a building or any project or anything is proposed, what they'll do is they design the mechanical, electrical, and plumbing systems for that building. So they'll get layouts from architects and civil engineers, go through all of those, put in the, the power receptacles, the lighting systems, plumbing, um, restrooms, all of that stuff. And then they send that off to the contractors to actually build it. So um, it's a smaller company. I think it's seven employees. And building their headquarters is probably the size of like your house. But they do a lot of projects, a lot of bigger ones. Um, the Delamar Hotel in downtown Traverse City, um, they did all the electrical and plumbing on that. They did the Dennis Museum at NMC. Hickory Hill Ski Lodge. Um, they've had projects all over the country even. I think they had one in Pennsylvania, something in South Carolina. So it's pretty far reach for a small company. Um, most of what's done there is done on CAD. Um, the majority is on AutoCAD. So in that you're modeling the lighting systems, the wiring, the plumbing, um, all of that. As you can see in that top right image, that is that is the, I think, electrical layout for a building. Um, and they also use Revit more for visualizing placement of things like power outlets, the lighting, all that. So both of those are used. There's also site visits. Um, one of my the first things I did there was a punch list where you just you kind of go through and. Um, you evaluate a project that's already been done to make sure it's done to code and make sure they did it as the engineers intended. And they'll also go in and investigate current systems that might be looking to expand or um, maybe be redone. So. What I did, I spent my first day mostly just shadowing the engineers there. Um, but later on, I spent a lot of time on AutoCAD. I did, what you can see on the top right there is the electrical layout for an expansion to Cherry Lane Humane Society, which was my doing entirely. And I also did a little bit of work on the 
mechanical system, so the heating, cooling, HVAC, or the Bayview Hotel project, which I don't remember where that is, but it, it's a big one. And there's also these Revit elevations where you're capturing the actual inside of the building to show where things are. Um, so it's just easier for the, or for the um, contractors to uh, build that stuff. And I, as I said, I did site visits. Um, went to Mitchell State Park to do that punch list I was talking about. That's a campground in Cadillac that just finished revamping their bathhouse. And the Cherryland Humane Society is planning a large expansion because they have a lot of animals coming in and they need more space. So, um, it's an engineering job, so obviously huge Cymatech applications, but a lot of physics going on with fluid flow, electrical current, airflow, all of that stuff. Um, with the Mac, it, there's a lot of calculations that go into that, so everything from finding the pipe diameter or you know, the type of wiring to determining the cost for the customer. And of course, technology, you have CAD is um, very big. And you also have to choose the right equipment from you know, heating units, cooling units, um, power boxes, all of that stuff. Things I liked, um, it was a very, since it was a small company, it was very laid back, it was very, it felt very friendly. So even though it was very professional work going on, people got along well. Like that picture up there, they had this little dart game with like a Nerf gun where every day you'd get three shots and try and get the highest score. So I did not do too well on it, but it was fun. Um, I like that it was a mix of field and desk work, so you're not spending nine hours behind a desk. You get to go out and see stuff, but you're also, you also have some time to relax in the office, and you, you can be on your own for a while. So it, it blends well together. And the work is pretty self-paced. Um, most of the engineers there have four, five, six projects going on at once, and they can just kind of work on whichever one they want when they want. So it's, it's very easy to you know, mix your job up and all that stuff. Um, takeaways, that was really my first real world experience in engineering and it uh, confirmed my interest in the field. So I, think this, I still think this is something I wanna do later on. Um, and before this, I was looking at mechanical engineering, but I really didn't look at electrical. After doing this, I think electrical is at least an option for me as well. So, opened up some new opportunities there. And I also got pretty good with AutoCAD and Revit, which I haven't used before. Um, we've used Fusion 360 here, which helped a lot. Um, came very easy to me since I under already understood other programs. So, I learned that there. Thank you to Jason Van Brocklin, who helped set this up, and everyone at Nialis, I think, did something with me at some point, so thank you to everyone there. And yeah, any questions? Cooper? How long did you do this? It was five days. I know for sure the, pro the thing for Cherryland was adopted and will be used. Um, some of the other stuff I'm not sure about, but assuming the, uh, the client uses Nialis's, um, uses their like markups and stuff, then they probably will be used as well. I was surprised, I was expecting it to be kind of a lot of tedious doing the same thing over and over, and it actually wasn't. It was pretty well mixed up, and I, I enjoyed it. 
a lot more than I thought it would, if I'm being honest. So, yeah. Anything else? So, um, my internship was at West Bay Exploration Company. You can see more about that right here. It's a family-owned company that uses modern geographical technology to locate and drill reserves of petroleum all across the U.S. West Bay Exploration is also the largest oil producer in Michigan, and one of the largest in the states. And there's an image taken from their website. And why I chose West Bay Exploration, the main reason was pretty simple, because my dad has worked there for a full 30 years. Pretty long time. So that made getting the internship a lot easier, and it also made just, it was more motivating, because I knew I'd be helping him out. Uh, but another thing that was really nice was things were very clear cut in what I needed to do. Like, had I needed to navigate gray areas on behalf of a big company, I kind of struggled to do that because I don't always know, like, their goals. But here it was just like, move this data from this place to this place. And it's relatively straightforward. Uh, I guess you'll see that right here. This is how I contributed. It started with some simple data transfers on wells. I would go onto these internet databases and manually scroll through information to determine uh, like how deep wells were and notable points throughout them, and then I would type this information back into a company program so that we could later run it through our own algorithms. And uh, as we got further and further into the internship, I started doing more and more forms of data transfer. Uh, most of it was pretty similar. Um, just I would scroll through and type it in. but. Uh, log digitization was a bit different. You can see it right there, that's an example, that's not one that I worked on, but it's, it's similar in format and structure. What I would need to do is I would need to define the left and right boundaries, so like the maximum and the minimum values, and I would need to click on points in the line, and then AI would follow that line, it would, it would try to follow the line of the graph, but I would need to set up some parameters for it to do that first. And even when it did do it, there were, sometimes the line would be faded and difficult to see, so I would still need to put it back on track if it ever uh, like started going off course. And yeah, some information that I transferred was underground formations. There are just specific things that you want to look for underground that indicate that there might be oil or some other form of energy. Uh, I would also deposit those if they were found. Um, I would, most wells already had their depth uh, stated, but there were a few where it was like inaccurate um, or sometimes I would just need to put it in there, but uh, more importantly, I would locate the depths of each notable point. And I would also do the shape of them by, uh, I would find the shape of the wells by determining the path of the drill bit. And 
yeah, there was, there was some more, but those were the main things. And what I learned is I learned of the existence of structures that can appear underground. Uh, I mean, they were mostly to me just little numbers, or not numbers, they were just little text strings. I, I don't entirely know what they are, but I know that they exist, and I know that to some degree they are connected to finding oil, which I thought was interesting. But um, more importantly, I learned that even like really simple work like this can be helpful uh, because, yeah, we used the data that I gathered to determine where areas were likely to hold oil. And I mean, I, I was able to transfer the data, but I barely even knew what it represented for the most part. I was just moving it from one place to another. And even though I didn't know very much about the grand scheme of how this whole process is carried out, I was still able to contribute. And it showed that sometimes you just need like anybody to help even if they're not an expert in that field or anything like that. And yeah, here are all the sources of the images that I used. Any questions? Um, probably not, but it was, it was nice to see it regardless. And West Bay Exploration, ah, West Bay Exploration is a company that I respect, so I was willing to take on an internship for them. I, I did a digitally, I would just use a company computer so I could do it anywhere. And I worked with my dad because he would, I would ask him for help if ever I needed to know how to do something. But other than that, I didn't really. No, not really. Um, there were specific, uh, just some, some forms of data were very long and it was, it was very tedious. Uh, it was manageable, but like I would just, I would be hitting the same few keys, scroll, same few keys, scroll over and over. I, I was just typing numbers. Uh, and like having to constantly look between two screens. Uh, and it was manageable, but it was a bit difficult, but it was, it was mostly just like tedious. <laughs> the most rewarding? Um, I actually got paid. So that was pretty dang nice. <laughs> <laughs> Probably just being able to, kn knowing that the information that I was putting in was uh, going to be used and everything. All right, so my name is Dak Schiller, um, and for my summer internship, I worked with pumping service. Well, they used to be known as Benzie Pumping. Benzie Pumping. 
that is the actual name of the public service. Um, so over the summer, I worked with them. He, the owner of the business, Nate Gettings, is also my neighbor. Um, whenever I was initially looking for the internship, I didn't really have a good idea of what I wanted to do. And he gave me an offer on something that I might be able to do over the summer. And I decided that seems like a fun opportunity and something new to try, so I jumped at it and um, worked with him throughout the summer for about two or three weeks, uh, not weeks, sorry, two or three months. I worked with him throughout the whole summer. I did way more time than I needed to for the internship. Um, I did get paid too, but I did learn a lot along the way and it was a lot of fun. Um, so, I'll talk about that a little bit. Um, I had work boots and I should probably talk about what I did. <laughs> so, the, I'm going to go back, hold on. So, the, so what the pump service is, is it is a service, he, the business has five pump trucks, if you don't, um, we go out to different houses throughout Benzie, Interlochen, Grand Travers, and we pump out septic tanks. We also install and maintain septic tanks, as well as ordering parts and stuff. So there was a lot of digging in the dirt, um, pumping out septic tanks, working with other construction companies to construct. Um, fields um, where the septic where the fluids from the tank will go out to the field and be reincorporated into the ground after they go through the system of the tank. So throughout um, I'll do that one. So we um, starting in the day I would usually get up at around six AM, seven AM. Yeah, 7 a.m. we started at 8. Um, he would pick me up and then we would drive out to the shop. Um, and then we would be given our assignments for the day. So like we would figure out what jobs we had to do for the day. Um, consisting of usually around 16 to 20 jobs per day. So we'd go to about 16 to 20 houses or sometimes um, go to one larger business. And then we would pump them out or do maintenance or do whatever they called and needed us to do. And then we would end up taking what we picked up to one of three different facilities, one Grand Travers, one Benzie, and one in, I forget where the last one was, but three different facilities, and those were wastewater treatment facilities. We would drop off there and then get back out and do more jobs. And then we finished around six, 6 p.m. on a good day, sometimes 5 if we had less jobs. It just really depended on how busy we were. Um, worked about 5 days a week, 10 hours a day. So if I was lucky, about 50 hours a week. It's a lot of time, a lot of manual labor. It's hard and very rewarding. I got three photos next. So there's a lot of digging. We worked with I forget how heavy the hoses were, but some heavier hoses, and we would take a truck, hook up the hoses, drag them out to the tank, and pump it up. It was really rewarding because you can actually see what you dig out and what you're actually accomplishing. Um, I also learned how to change tires and work with some engines and stuff. Um, changing tires, the photo on the right, that took us about an hour and a half to figure out how to change a tire um, because he had just gotten new tools so we were messing around with those and trying to figure out how they worked. And then the photo on the left is from one of his drivers. Um, whenever he was doing a job during the day, he blew out one of the tires on a highway and pulled over to the side and had called tow trucks and stuff. So, yeah. And then this is a fun photo. So um, this was the person that I was assigned with for the day. And the lady had a ton of roots growing all throughout her pipes and plumbing. 
So he had to actually go into the tank in order to try and remove it. We did end up calling for other rooters later on to see if they could get any more out. But yeah. And then takeaways from this is it's not the most, um, <laughs> it depends on what kind of person you are, but um, it, it's not the most enjoyable job depending on smells and if you want to be stuck in the truck for six hours a day. Um, but it is very rewarding and there's a lot of fun stuff that we get to experience and do and learn. So. Any questions? Kyle? Um, no. Well, I wasn't sure. The first little while was me just kind of trying it out and seeing if it was something that I wanted to continue and pursue, pursue and do. Because he offered it to me and I know not a lot of people want to jump at the option of working for a pumping company. And so I kind of decided to try it out a little bit. And then after that, he offered me a little bit of money to do some stuff. So I continued to do it. Cool. Did you back next summer? It depends on his schedule and stuff. But yes, I do probably plan on going back and continuing to work if he'll take me back. Ms. Bartley? Uh, there is a giant pump, yes. I wish I had a better photo. I wanted to go back to the beginning. So the truck up on the left, on the back, or no. Okay, so you see the box closest to the cab. That is where the pump is. So it's a vacuum system that you can turn on and off. So there's a such a better way to explain it. Um, so yeah, it's a vacuum. So there's a lever on top that we move to towards the back of the truck that will turn, engage the pump, and it is essentially, it's a giant suction. So whenever we stick the, um, the hoses into the tank, it, ta it sucks in the water and sucks it up into the tank. So it's like, it's like a giant vacuum. Um, and then there's also another mechanism on that pump where we can flip it around so then we can push it out or we can just turn it off and just let it like put it into neutral so then all the water just flows out. So is there like a vacuum system on the back that goes like to the bowl and then pulls out? So yes. <laughs> I think it, I don't know how, I don't know that part of it, but I know that there is, I'm pretty sure there's a mechanism on the side that kind of filters out and allows some air to seep in, so then it doesn't implode. Yeah, it keeps the pressure. Um, yeah. Any other questions? Yes. <laughs> you really want to know? <laughs> um, we did... We did bolts. Now you probably don't know what those are, but they're the, so you know at all of the national parks that we have in Michigan. Underneath every single stationary porta potty, there is a concrete box that everything goes into. We had to pump out, we pumped those out. Um, there is anything from toilet paper, clothes, tampons, diapers, anything in there. So we get a trash can and we throw away half of that stuff after we pull it out because it'll get stuck in the hoses and in the truck, and then we can't get it out. Yeah, I would say more, but there's a lot more gross stuff that we did. <laughs> oh yeah, the grease. So, a lot of people don't know this, but so, um, restaurants, they separate the grease from the actual sewage because the sewage and the grease don't mix because then they the grease will harden in the sewage and then it becomes like rocks, basically, whenever we suck it up and it doesn't, doesn't go well through the tube. So they have a grease trap at different restaurants and places that deal with a lot of grease. 
So what we do is we pump out the grease traps. It's like, I don't know a good answer for it. It's like concrete almost. It's like you can pull it apart. It's orange and it's disgusting. It smells worse than sewage. It's, it's terrible. But we have to drop it off at different parts of the plants that we take it and drop it off to. So, yeah. Any other questions? I did my internship at the hand surgery of Northern Michigan. Um, it's just that like brick building on Front Street. Um, while I was there, I was able to shadow two different doctors, those two right over there, uh, Dr. Mark Leslie and Dr. Paul Jacobson. They are both orthopedic hand surgeons, um, and we'll talk about more what they do in a second, but how I chose them. About a year and a half ago, I dislocated my left thumb from hockey. Um, and both those are my hands. The one on the left is when it was dislocated. You can see a little bit of a bump there. That's where my bone was out of its socket. And then my whole palm started swelling up. Um, I went to Munson for an x-ray and then I just went straight over to the hand surgery of Northern Michigan where they put me in a cast. Um, and you know, told me what I could or could not do to help it get better. Um, what also helped is my dad, who is also a doctor, uh, is friends with both Dr. Leslie and Dr. Jacobson. So, yeah. What do they do? So, um, at the Hand Surgery Northern Michigan, um, they kind of deal with a really wide variety of uh, injuries or um, conditions. They're really one of the very few, if not only, like hand specialists uh, around here in Traverse City. So there was a ton of stuff that we saw. There was trigger fingers, which is where finger, people's fingers can get locked up and then they have to have surgery or a shot to get rid of that. They have like carpal tunnel, um, uh, broken bones, some um, like destroyed bones where they had like an impact injury and then the bone shattered. Those are always tough. Um, but yeah, they deal with a ton of different stuff there. Uh, so what I did, um, both these are the in the building that I took. It's of the surgery suite they have there. So I was not able to go to Copper Ridge Surgery Center or Munson because I'm not allowed there. But uh, in the building, they had their own surgery suite uh, where they could do relatively minor hand surgeries in office where the people would not have to be put down. They would just numb the area and then do what they needed to do. And I was able to observe those, which was really cool. Um, when I went there on non-surgery days, because they only did the surgery days maybe once or twice a month, um, but on non-surgery days, I was able to follow around um, both of the doctors and t talk to patients, see what the doctors would um, do for them a lot of the time. If it was like a joint problem, they do like a cortisone shot. Uh, sometimes there were stitches or just removing stitches. Um, some casts were put on. Just a lot of that stuff, uh, which was really cool. I, going into it, I was not completely sure what I was going to be able to do. Um, but I ended up being able to watch and observe a lot more than I thought I was going to be able to do. So. Uh, STEM connections. So, um, isn't, as you could probably imagine, it's surgery, so uh, almost all of it is science-based. Um, also, but with technology, that machine on the left there is called a desiccator. And what they use that for is this surgery called a denervation which they use for um, arthritis in the thumb joint. And they basically just cut the skin here and then use the desiccator to cauterize the nerves leading to the joint. 
Um, and that doesn't fix the actual bone problem with the arthritis, but that gets rid of the nerves um, that have the pain for it. So they can still use their thumb completely fine and like feel it fine, but there's just no pain anymore. Um, there also with technology, there was like the x-ray machine. They use x-rays quite a bit, as you could imagine, in orthopedic surgery. Math, uh, there was a lot of math, especially when um, the doctors uh, used an anesthetic on people. Um, they would use a mix of a couple different drugs, one to numb them immediately and then one to keep them numb for a few hours. They would have a specific mix of those. Um, not completely sure what that ratio is, but um, yeah, a lot of math went into that. Um, and yeah. So here I just have some pictures I took uh, in the office. These are just, the next few sides are just some x-rays. Um, these were pins going in on all of the fingers and some of the joints of a patient. Um, these are just some more pins here on the actual wrist bone. It looks like there was a fracture in the wrist. A screw going into someone's finger and it looks like a joint replacement. This one was just a joint replacement. You can see the two screws there and some of the measurements there that also has to do with the math. Um, when doing especially these kind of things you can't go too far in otherwise you know it won't work and you can't not go far enough otherwise it won't be strong enough to keep the joints there's a lot of math that goes in there too this uh case was particularly brutal um this patient had a severe i think it was an atv accident and as you can see the pinky is completely gone and like gone all the way down into the hand. And the reason why they couldn't just reattach it was because it wasn't severed, it was crushed. And that's where you can see like the bones down there, it's still fractured and then I, the middle finger still has a fracture there that's healing up. Um, yeah, that one was um, really tough. Okay, so a fair warning. Um, <laughs> I was able to take pictures of the surgeries with full consent of the patients and the doctor. Um, but if anyone has a weak stomach, doesn't like seeing blood or cuts, then you should either leave or look away. Okay. So this one was a ganglion cyst that uh, Dr. Leslie, I believe, took out of someone's joints. What's weird about ganglion cysts is they grow from the joint fluid. So they have to not only remove that, but use like a, almost pliers to remove splints from the joint. Um, but yeah, like those are usually the size of the cuts for a lot of stuff like that. It's not very big and can easily be sealed up. That is a carpal tunnel surgery. And carpal tunnel, what it basically is, is with all the tendons and nerves running to the hand, it goes through a tunnel, the, what it's called, the carpal tunnel. And when either the carpal tunnel gets too constricted or the tendons and ligaments swell too much, it puts too much pressure on the nerves going through the same tunnel, which is what causes the pain and the nerve damage and the numbness in the hands. So what they do is basically just cut through the skin and the um, just fat in the hands and then they just cut open the tunnel and then they seal them back up and then the pressure is relieved. Depending on how long the patient has had it, um, they could still feel like numbness and some pain until the nerves heal, but usually it provides a lot of relief right away. That's Dr. Leslie actually cutting through the skin and the tunnel. And then that's what it looks like immediately after. Um, he just seals it right up and he, they usually have a tourniquet on and even with the surgeries we're like going back, you can see like it's wide open. Um, I believe what he would tell most of his patients is like three days, three to five days keeping the dressing that they would put on on, keeping it dry. Um, and then after three days they can just take the dressing off and just like get a glove to wear around it, can get it wet, um, and can basically do anything they want to do. Which is one thing that was really surprising to me is with like these actual like surgery surgeries, um, 
the patients were able to like go back to work and use their hand completely fine within like a week, which was really cool to see. This one was another ganglion cyst. Um, one of the things they use really often is that little orange ring uh, right around the finger. It's called tourniquet. Um, uh, that is used to constrict the blood flow so there's not a lot of blood when they're actually doing the surgery. Um, makes it cleaner for the doctor, also makes the patient lose less blood. This one was a pretty decently sized ganglion cyst. Um, that's Dr. Leslie taking it out. And then that's the actual cyst. Um, and then, yeah, that's him closing it up again. This is a picture I took of just the setup of the tray that they would have. The, in the top right corner, the tweezer looking things with cords coming out of it, that's the desiccator. Um, what goes into that box is just a cord. And then that cord leads to those tweezers, and that's how they can have a lot of precision when uh, cutting the nerves and um, doing the actual surgery. Um, uh, that's just another one. I think those plier-looking things in the middle are the things that they would use to take the splints out of people's fingers. And that fluid is not blood. It is betadine, which is really the only... Um, antibacterial that the doctors would use. Um, they used rubbing alcohol one time because a patient said that he had an allergic reaction to betadine, but betadine is what they would use. They would just put it on, let it dry, um, and that would sterilize the area, and then after they do the surgery, even when the patient's open, they put betadine in the wound and then around the wound, and then that's when they would wrap it up. That is Amy, who was the surgical assistant on the left me in the middle, and then Kim, who would sterilize all of the um, tools and help with just like the lights and stuff like that. Dr. Leslie is in the yellow scrubs in the middle. Um, he was really funny. He would always tell horrible jokes to all of his patients. And what was funny to see is like he would say some of the same jokes just over and over again, um, which was just kind of funny. Uh, he had a really good relationship with most of his patients. Is really cool. That's the actual surgical suite in the office. And yeah. Um, honestly, I really enjoyed watching the surgeries. Um, there was this one time, though, that was kind of funny that sticks in my mind a lot, where this one person who is just holding his son's hand up, who is getting stitches removed, it was like a big, burly military man, too. Um, while Dr. Jacobson was removing the stitches, he passed out, um, which was really tough because he was just holding his son's hand, and then it twisted more, which was horrible because he had the two bones here break. Um, so they had to redo the x-ray. Um, luckily, it wasn't broken more, but that's just something that stuck in my mind, and I had to grab the ammonia salt thing, so... Oh yeah, um, for all of the surgeries I observed, the patients were fully awake. They just numbed their hand, really. Not even their arm, just their hand like here. Some patients watched, some didn't. But um, yeah, everyone was awake.
My name is Cooper, and I did my internship at Tankcraft this summer. And so a little bit about Tankcraft is they are known for the production of high quality tents. And I may be a little biased because I worked there. I believe they were the, the best on the market. And with that came a price which was pretty expensive. He also made things such as custom banners and trade show booths. And they've collaborated with a bunch of big names across the US, including like Nike, Disney, Adidas, the NFL. There's this whole list of like 30 big names on their website, and that's just to name a few of them. And you see in the bottom left right there, that is one of the tents that they manufactured. And the picture on the right is just their logo. And here's a few more pictures of the custom tents, which I thought were pretty unique. You got the soccer.com dome one. That one I thought was pretty fascinating. You got some inflatable tents, which I didn't, at first glance didn't look like an inflatable tent. And then I thought that uh, the custom Nike tent was unique, because so it kind of modeled like a shoebox. So this is where it gets a little confusing. So I was hired under Tent Craft, but in 2020 they had an expansion to their company called Century Covers, and they would work on these automatic pool covers, as you see in the bottom two pictures, which would retract a uh, cover over a pool, and you can also get these custom images on it. For example, in the bottom right, uh, you see the American flag that's printed on it. These are typically for higher end homes as they tend to be just a little bit pricey. I was, during my internship, I was working on manufacturing these pool covers. So there are three things I did over the two weeks that I worked there. I did some general production, which is you see, which you see in like the bottom middle picture right there, going pylon boxes. All I did is I laid them down, laid some metal bars in them, uh, screwed some holes, riveted it up, moved on to the next one. And that would typically occupy around two hours of my day. It's what I did when pretty much busy work was nothing else to do. I also did some sub-assemblies, which are the remainder of the pictures. I would be either uh, instructed by one of the engineers there to look at schematics, and he'd teach me how to build them. And the top is a picture of end result of one. Or I would be giving, given like a booklet of instructions, which you see in the picture on the right. And I have to read through that, figure out how to build it, and build it myself. So for the company at Century Covers I worked for, it, since it's relatively new, there were only five people working there. There were three engineers, uh, me and another high schooler named Ethan. So the first one was Zeb. He was the assembly specialist. He would be the one that would typically uh, give me the sub-assemblies to work on, and he would pretty much give me my work. Clint was the general manager. He kind of first opened up the extension of the company, he had the idea. And every day at 3.30, he'd take all employees, all five of us, and we'd play nine holes of disc golf in the factory. Uh, they were huge on just making work a fun place. And there were plenty of dents inside the whole factory of discs that were slammed to the wall and probably machines that were most likely broken, but I enjoyed it. I can choose to either work for those 45 minutes or get an extra 45 minute paid break. And Ryan. Ryan's the person on the far right. He was the one who I shadowed, the engineer. And he individually designed every single part that went into the retractable pool cover because he noticed that in the market he saw some flaws, some like crucial design flaws that he wanted to fix. And uh, I ended up shadowing him a few times. Uh, one of the, the first time I shadowed him, he drove me back over to the uh, Tentcraft home base and he manufactured on CAD this new foot plate for tents where he could take like these uh, puck weights for tents that would be placed like on concrete where you can't uh, hammer in stakes and he would want to put these weights around these uh, the, the feet of the tent and want to see at what weight would the, uh, the foot plate start to bend and how much pressure that you could push on it before they started to move so they can rate it at what winds it's unsafe to have these tents up at. And so that was a pretty cool experience. I got to witness the engineering testing process firsthand. And we got Ethan on top right. He's just another high schooler that goes here, I believe, in the SM, uh, assignment type program. And he worked with me pretty much for my two weeks span that I was there. So why I believe engineering is a good field, this is just for like vaguely for engineering. First off is problem solving. If you are big into trying to figure out to fix problems and analyze complex problems. Engineering could be a field for you. Another thing is uh, innovation. 
Uh, engineering drives a lot of technological advancement, so that interests you once again, this would be a good field. There's also diverse specializations. A lot of people get this idea of what an engineer is, but, but there are so many things you can choose from that spans everywhere, such as like civil, electrical, mechanical, aerospace, and chemical. There's a whole lot of things that you can do. There's also a huge global impact. If you want to make an like a important change in the world, such as uh, engineering new ways for sustainable energy, once again, this could be a good field. There's also a lot of job opportunities. Uh, engineering is a rapidly growing field, and there's a high demand for workers. So if you were to get a degree, it would not be difficult in order to find a job. There's also continuous learning. A lot of engineers rely heavily on technology, and especially with smart AI nowadays, uh, it's evolving rapidly and a lot of it's being integrated. So if you are, like I believe that people are inherently curious, and so this is the type of profession that would allow you to keep learning as you get more experience inside the field. There's also financial stability. Engineers tend to be paid a hefty sum because they're skilled at what they do and they are a necessity. And there's also a collaborative environment. If you like either working in teams of people, you can work on big projects such as engineering new sustainable energy sources, or like Ryan, who I worked with, you can work independently to design something by yourself. So you can choose whether or not you want to work in a collaborative environment or just individually by yourself. And then, any questions? Ryan, the engineer, actually played disc golf professionally, and he traveled across the United States playing disc golf. And so he set up uh, holes there as an excuse, I believe, to get an extra paid break. And my manager liked that because he's always finding ways to you know, lift everyone's spirits. Yeah. It's like every few months or so, they change the course up, and you have nine new holes inside the factory. Seth? No, I was, I mean, it got me into disc golf, now I disc golf now, but uh, these guys have been playing it every single day since the company opens, and like I said, Ryan played it professionally across the United States, so I wasn't much of a match, but it was still pretty fun. Since it's still relatively new, we didn't really have much of the machines to manufacture the parts ourselves. So we'd buy like the individual pieces and we have to assemble it ourselves. So we'd import the products from other factories. And it didn't always come perfect because I remember we got one shipment. It was like these 900, these small metal beams and we used this oil to cut it. And because of the oil that they used to help cut the metal bars, we couldn't do one of our things we need to do with it, so we need to individually take these sanitizer wipes and wipe down all 900 of these rods, which probably took four hours. That was probably the most tedious part of my job, was those four hours right there. 